Zoom that we are on. Uh, it is uh, good to be here, even though it is in a different kind of way. Uh, when I when I go to a conference, it, it's sort of like this. You know, I go to a conference and the, the speaker is you know, we're in the stadium, so the speaker is so far away that what they do is they they uh, they get the projection, they, they project it on the screens over there. So the big name speakers down there, and you can't see them, so you look at the, the big screen. So you can pretend that this morning that I'm the big name speaker, and here I am on the screen, just as if you had gone to some conference. Somewhere. Anyway, I uh, saw that Ben had an app that's never going to handle the Lord's Supper, so uh, be aware of that. And we are going to take some time this morning and consider the Word of God. So we are going to be in 2 Peter, so please turn your Bibles to 2 Peter and pray with me. Please pray with me. Oh Lord God, thank you for this morning and thank you for your grace. I thank you for your presence. I thank you, Lord, that you are at work no matter what, and I just give you praise that, uh, that your spirit is moving in our hearts to draw us closer to you. Be with us, Lord, as we look into your word and consider the truths that you have given to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I want to read verses 5 through 11. So please follow along, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 5 through 11 says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to consider uh, some of the things that, that uh, this passage says. And I've entitled the message, Octagon Christians. Octagon Christians. So there's a reason for this, and then maybe you'll figure it out by the time I'm done. But basically, the passage is coming from two, two uh, places of Scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And what I want to do is I'm going to take uh, two uh, Sundays to go over the, this passage. First of all, I want to, today, which I'm going to do today, I want to cover these things that are listed for us in verses 5 through 7. And then next week, Lord willing, I want to look at the significance or the impact of these things because it is really pretty huge. What it says in this passage is, is so significant and is so impactful for us as believers. We've already seen in verses 3 through 3 and 4 how God has given us his divine power, through his divine power, he has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. That in itself is uh, impactful for our life. But then there are these great and precious promises which he has given, and that is impactful for our life. And then he has, del he has delivered us, he has caused us to escape the corruption of the world, and that is huge in our lives. And so we move into this next section here, and he continues to just encourage the believers that what God has given, and, and the life he has called us to, can really make a significant difference in our lives. And, uh, and, and here is really the, the truth of it all, that as Christians, we should be different than the rest of the world. There, there is so much that has been given to us that it causes this divide or this distinction, this separation between who we are as Christians and what God has left us with and who the rest of the world is. And so, uh, as we live our lives, this should become more and more manifest as time goes on. So we want, to, we want to consider these things, and the first one I want to look at is faith. So this is found in verse 5. It says, "For all, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence Add to your faith. Add to your faith. And then you're going to add to your faith virtue and, uh, and so on. Now, um, when we talk about faith, 
we, we don't need to make a distinction here whether we're talking about the faith of salvation and the faith that follows salvation. Uh, basically, faith is faith. And so we are to have faith in God, and that is to the saving of our souls. But after we are saved, we continue to have faith in our lives, and that is to carry us through in all seasons. Faith is so important. Um, so what is faith? Uh, you know, that's one question we have to ask. And we go to the classic definition found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and it says this, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So basically, according to this verse, what our faith is, it is uh, that which carries us now towards the things that we hope for. So in other words, we trust in God for the forgiveness of, of our sins unto eternal life. So that is our hope, eternal life. We haven't really got there yet, although we experience some of it now, but we're heading towards eternal life. So in the meantime, our faith, we are having faith, it is the substance of that hope. That faith that we have now in God carries us towards our hope. It is the substance of that hope that we have. So this is a, a kind of a technical definition of faith, but I think that we can kind of narrow it down a little bit uh, more simply. And so basically when we talk about faith, we are talking about two things. There's two components here that I want to bring out this morning. First of all, faith is taking God at his word. It is believing what God has said. That's the first part of faith. So if you want to have faith, well, believe what God said. That's the first part. And then the second part is to give substance to that belief uh, in God. Um, believe what God said and then act on it. Act on it. If you're really going to have faith, in what God said, and then you're going to act on it. So this is this is uh, what faith is all about. It is taking God out of His Word and living that like we do. In uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, just a few verses after the one I read, it says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So this is a great verse. First of all, faith is necessary. If you want to please God, you must have faith. So you, you, you must believe in Him. You must take Him at His word. And you must uh, show that you believe what He says by acting on it. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. He who comes to God must believe that He is. And He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So this is faith. So Peter is coming here and he's saying, he's saying look, you take your faith and you add to it. Now, this uh, this word in verse 5, it says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. This word add is going to be really important in the context of these things that I talked about. It really means to supply or to provide that which is necessary. So we might understand it this way. If we are going to build a house, let's say, we are going to supply for ourselves all of the materials that we need in order to build it. And that's going to include the wood and the nails and the cement and whatever else goes into building a house. We're going to get all of these things and we're going to supply ourselves with them so that we can build our house. So here it is. Uh, the same kind of idea goes here. We are to take this faith that we have and we are to supply to it so that we can build upon it. And uh, like I said at the beginning, what Peter says here is pretty amazing. Uh, if we have these things that he talks about, starting with our faith, if we have these things in our lives as Christians, we are going to uh, abound. If these, about, if these are present and about, we are not going to be barren, we are not going to be unfruitful. Uh, and so this is, this is talking about this uh, significant Christian life that we have if these things are present. So we want to make sure that this is characteristic of us. So here it is. One of the things that we are to supply for ourselves is that faith in God. We are to increase in faith day by day. Our faith should be stronger today than it was when we first believed in him. I love what it says about Stephen. Uh, the, the early church was going through some struggles and uh, they had they had uh, to uh, provide for the widows. That was one of the early things in Acts chapter 6. And so they needed some people to come along and they were looking for some. 
that uh, showed a strong Christian mature faith. And so they find Stephen. It says this in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And, and this is an, ought to be an inspiration for us. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen. Now here's what it says of him. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. That, that, that's the kind of characteristic that should show up in us. We should be full of faith. Full of faith. Uh, um, that is, like I said, an inspiration for me. I want to be like that. I want to be full of faith. And not only should we be full of faith, we should be full of the love of faith. Um, the faith that we have is necessary for living this life that we live. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't go according to how the world looks or appears to us only, but the trust and belief in God supersedes what we see in this world. So we walk by that faith in God. Now, as you can imagine, the disciples, as they were uh, walking with Jesus and they were seeing him do all of these things, they asked him a very important question. And I'm going to read from Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. So if you turn there in your Bible, Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. And here's the, the uh, statement that the disciples bring to Jesus in verse 5. Luke 17, 5. The apostles said to the Lord, and here it is, increase our faith. Hey, now that's a pretty reasonable statement to make to Jesus. They know faith is important, and they see faith in the life of Jesus manifested, and they want that for their life. Increase our faith. So here's the response of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, at first blush, it doesn't seem like the Lord answers their question. But there are two things to see about Jesus when he says about uh, faith in response to their statement here. Verse 6, first of all, says, The Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would be obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him, When he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all of these things, which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what is our duty to do. Now, there are two things about Jesus' statement here concerning the great faith. So they say to Jesus, increase our faith. He said, if you have just a little bit of faith, you can say to this tree, be uprooted and thrown into the sea. Now we're used to the other uh, passage in Matthew that says you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. But um, uh, here it uses the idea of a tree, and of course, you know, uh, the bigger the tree, the, the bigger the root system, and, and uh, the more difficult it is to uh, just to, you can't just move it. So, you know, this is the kind of faith. You have just a little bit of faith, you can move it. You can move that tree, you can move that mountain. And so that's a, another encouragement to us. Not only is Stephen full of faith, which is what I want to be full of faith, but I want, uh, all it takes is just to use that a little bit of faith to be able to move the great thing. So that's the first thing that Jesus says. He's encouraging them. Yes, this is a good thing. Just use a little bit of your faith that you have. And then he goes on to talk about this servant. Now, here's the puzzling thing. If you have a servant, he says, you're basically not treating him like a member of the family. He comes in from the field and you don't tell him, hey, have a rest. You tell him, go prepare the food and bring it in. And then, you know, once he does that, then, then he can go and eat. And he likens that to us as Christians. And so when the master of the house, God, Give us the instructions to do, we are to do it and not expect anything else above that. There's no thanks that comes to us. He is the master, we are the slave. There's no, there's no profit that comes to us because of it. He gave us the command and we are to do it. Now that's that might sound a little harsh, but this is the reality of our relationship to God. And I don't think that uh, 
we have spoiled Western Americans really can grasp the significance of this, the fact that he is the master and we are the servant. He is the king and we are the servant. And if he says do this, then we ought to run to do that. And here is the answer to the increase of our faith. And it is this. If you want to increase your faith, just do the things that God has told you to do. Just plain and simple. Don't expect anything in return. Don't expect any thanks. Don't expect a pat on the back. He is the king. He is the master. We are the servant. Let us do our duty. That is the operation of faith. The servant who does that, when we as Christians do that, we show that we acknowledge him as our master and king. We we submit ourselves to him as the master and king. We want to be used by him, our master and king. We want to be used by him. We want to serve him. We want to do a good job. All of that expresses the fact that we believe in him. We trust in him. He is ours. We are his. And, and, and that's what faith is all about. Taking God in his word and acting upon him. So make sure that faith is an important part of your life as a Christian, it ought to be one of those things that characterize us. Now Peter goes on and he says, add to your faith, we come to the next one here, add to your faith virtue, add to your faith virtue. Now the word virtue we have already been introduced to it in verse 3. At the end of verse 3, let me read verse 3 because I love verse 3. It says, As his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And this word virtue is a really important word. We don't talk about it too often. It is a quality or characteristic of God, but there it is in verse 3. It's one of those characteristics of God. And it is one of the things that ought to be characteristic of of our life as well. So, what is this virtue? Well, the word virtue means uh, excellence. It, it means that probably towards the idea of moral excellence or integrity. And I had talked about this a little bit, but it is so important for us that the Christian ought to be identified, among other things, for his integrity, for his moral excellence. This is how we ought to be. And so when the world charges the church for being full of hypocrites, it's because they have this understanding that there is a certain godliness that ought to reflect the Christian, and these Christians don't have it because they're just like us when they're not in church. And that is kind of a shame. It should not be like that. When the world looks at the Christian, they might not like the Christian, but at least they can say, well, yeah, I don't like him, but he's honest, and, and he does good work in his business, and he won't cheat you, and he won't lie to you. He's going to be honest, and, uh, and all of those things. There's a, this moral virtue, this moral excellence that ought to uh, characterize the believer. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, uh, again, in our society today, there is a, a greater need for this among believers than ever before. We must live lives that are characterized by moral excellence and integrity. When we, uh, when we go forth, we should speak the truth, we should live the truth, and it should be a reflection of our relationship to Jesus Christ. And so, Christian, let us together go forth and add or supply to our faith uh, this moral excellence or integrity. Let us be different and unique from the rest of the world. All right, so that's uh, that one. We come to the next one in our passage here. And the next thing that we are to supply to our Christian lives is knowledge. Now, this is a theme for Peter. We've already seen it come up uh, once. So we're supposed to have faith, we're supposed to have virtue or moral excellence or integrity, and then we're supposed to have knowledge. And this is the knowledge of God, this is knowing who he is, and this is knowing about him. It is something that we are to grow uh, in concern with our Christian life. So when I'm not, when I wasn't a Christian, I did not know that much about God. I had never read the Bible before, and I didn't know anything about him except, you know, little pieces here and there that I had heard, and who knows, I couldn't tell if it was true or not. I had no knowledge of God. 
But then I believed in him, and I came to him, and I trusted in him, and I began to read his word, and I began to hear people preaching the word, and people teaching the word, and my knowledge began to grow of him. And this is right, and this is good, and this is fitting. One of the gifts that God has given uh, to the church is the teacher, and the preacher, and the, the prophet, and the evangelist, and all of these people proclaim forth the word of God, so that people can hear the truth and change their lives as a result of it. And so we grow in our knowledge of him. If we spend time learning about anything in this world, there ought to be time set apart to learn about him, to learn more about our Lord and our Savior. And so we grow in the knowledge of him. As a matter of fact, the epistle of 2 Peter ends with this idea of knowledge. The very last verse, this is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and it says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So that's how Peter ends this epistle with this knowledge. It's already been mentioned several times in these first few verses, and it's going to continue to run through the epistle as an undercurrent, and it ends with this exhortation to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All praise be to him. So supply to your life knowledge. The next thing that we have to add to our lives is uh, found here again in this uh, verse 6 this time. So it says, add to your knowledge self-control. So that's the next one. This is the fourth one. Faith, virtue, knowledge, and self-control. Now self-control is extremely, extremely important. When it comes to um, when it comes to living this life, when it comes to living this life in this world, there is to be the exercise of self-control. We are to control, as Christians, we are to control our bodies. We are to control our minds. As a matter of fact, uh, we were just looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, that talks about the, the attacks that come against the mind. Oh, this was last Sunday, one of the ideas of warfare uh, in the corruption, escaping the corruption of this world, that uh, the thoughts come into our mind and we just take captive those thoughts. And so we are to control our mind. We are to control our passions. We are to control our actions. We are to control our words. The, the Christian is not to just spout off everything that comes into the head and the um, act upon every passion that moves across the, the heart. And uh, uh, this is not the life of the Christian. We are not to just go with the flow of the impulses of who we are. We are instead to exercise self-control. Now, now, this is really important. And, and I might say that, and you might be sitting uh, sitting there and thinking, well, you know, I don't know about that. That doesn't seem quite right. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is a false philosophy of our world that says that we must, be, uh, we must express ourselves, we must be free to express ourselves, we must be true to ourselves, which means, you know, however we're thinking or feeling on the inside is, you know, what must come out, otherwise we're just not being true to ourselves. And, and this is a really pervasive philosophy of our day, and it is contrary to what God said. God says that we are not to express ourselves in that way because we are full of sin and the things that we want to express are sinful. Our flesh is sinful and heads towards sinful tendencies. We are to bring uh, these things under control. We are to rein them in. We are to gird up the loins of our mind, it says in 1 Peter. And, and we are to... Uh, exercise this control over the simple, passionate impulses of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And so to be true to God, we're not to be true to ourselves, we're to be true to God. And we are to live after his promptings and his leading. 
We are not to walk in the flesh. We are to walk in the spirit. As a matter of fact, this is uh, so important that if we are walking in the spirit, this is going to be, uh, Galatians chapter 5 tells us that self-control is one of the fruits of the spirit. So here it is, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here it is, self-control. Against such, there is no love. And so we are to contribute to our lives this uh, our Christian life, this idea of self-control that is extremely, extremely important, and it is that which goes contrary to what the world is telling us. So be aware of that, and allow this to be full in your life. All right, the next, uh, the next important quality here is found in uh, verse six again. Add to your knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance. Perseverance, uh, steadfastness uh, is another word for it. Perseverance, steadfastness, endurance. This is the keeping on going. Keep going when the going gets tough. Uh, you know, we have a saying in our our world that this that uh, when things get tough, uh, you know, as Christians we are to keep going. Proverbs chapter twenty-four verse sixteen says, "A righteous man may fall seven times and rises again." So we might fall on seven is like, you know, forgiving. You know, should I forgive seven times? And Jesus says not seven times, but seven times seven. Uh, in other words, this is not, this doesn't mean that you get beat up or defeated seven times and then you can give up. This is, uh, every time you fall, you just get back up and you keep on going. And you fall, get back up and you keep on going. You fall again, keep on going. Uh, God wants the righteous man. This is a characteristic of the quality of the righteous man. It is perseverance through our times. You know, Jesus says he was going to the cross and he was on the cross and, and all of a sudden he said, well, you know, he thought to himself, well, this is too much for me. I, I just, I don't have to do this and I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do this. And he gave up. <laughs> and it was completely different for him. But that's not how it turned out. He persevered through the cross, looking for the glory that was ahead of him. In Hebrews chapter 12, we are encouraged to this perseverance in the light of our battle against sin. It says in Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance. There it is, the race that is set before us. So in verse 1 there, it says sin comes against us, and it comes against us so easily. It is this is so easy to be ensnared by sin. But let us lay aside sin and the weight and let us run with endurance. So keep on going. Don't give up. I know it gets tough. Uh, we're all facing tough things. Some of us are facing tougher things than others of us. But it doesn't matter. Just keep going through all the tough times and through all the difficult circumstances. Keep going forward to Jesus. And that's what it says in the next verse, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. There's the idea of faith coming in again. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility. There it is, he endured it. Such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. What a great passage. This is, this is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Do not be discouraged. Do not become weary in your soul, but endure fixing your eyes upon Jesus. Praise the Lord. What a great verse that is. So as we move on, the next one here. And this is also found in, at the end of verse 6 there. Add to your perseverance godliness. Godliness. Uh, when we consider godliness, we're considering kind of the overall flavor or character of who we are. When people look at us, they ought to think, wow, there is a godly woman right there. There is a godly man. There is a godly youth. And, and that's the kind of thought that, that ought to uh, be towards us as Christians. We need to take the idea of becoming more and more like him and uh, build that up in our Christianity. 
as we live this Christian life, we ought to be aware or at least think that we need to become more and more like him. We need to become more and more godly. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, well, 2 Peter chapter 3 is a real exciting passage of scripture. We're going to be talking about the end times and the promise of God to, to uh, bring about his kingdom and all, and all of that. Chapter 3 is really great. This is part of what he says in 2 Peter chapter 3. It says in verse 11, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, it is, all this world is going to be destroyed. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Uh, what a powerful passage here. It tells us, again, basically this, that this world is going to be destroyed. Therefore, we ought to be all the more holy and godly in our conduct. So, uh, God is bringing this world to an end. This is not the end of it. And therefore, you know, since He's in control and He's bigger than it, and we're His servants, let us be more like Him in this temporary world that is going to be destroyed. So, be more and more godly in your lives. All right, the next one here brotherly affection. Now, these, these last two, actually, I'm going to put both of them up here just for a moment. You have these last two, number seven and number eight. Brotherly affection and love. Now, in Greek, there are three words, basically, to convey the idea of love. There are, there are three Greek words, and two of them are here in our passage. One of them is brotherly affection, or brotherly love. This is the word that we get Philadelphia from, the city of brotherly love. That's where it comes from. And then you have agape, this last word, agape, love. And so if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you've heard of agape, and that's uh, an important uh, kind of love here. Um, well, they're both important, but that's the one that we talk a lot about when we talk about Christ loving the world and giving himself to us. So you have these two, brotherly love and agape love. And these are two of the kinds of love that ought to characterize us. So first of all, there's brotherly affection. This is not saying that we ought to love our brother. That's not what it says at all. It is the kind of love that we show a brother. It is brotherly kind of affection. It is the it is the familial, you know, uh, you're a part of my family, you're close to me, we are good friends, and you, know, you put your arm around and walk together and you help each other out. That's the brotherly kind of love and affection. And this is the kind of uh, affection that we ought to have. We were reading in Luke chapter 4 this morning in Bible study. I, I did this for our Bible study time as well. So I, I don't know how it went. I hope it went all right. But in Luke chapter 4, we were talking about Jesus. He went into the synagogue and he read from Isaiah. And uh, so he's in the synagogue and he's reading the Bible to the people there. He reads this passage and he ends his reading by saying, Today this is fulfilled uh, in your hearing. This passage has become fulfilled. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm the Messiah. I'm the fulfillment of this passage. So the people, uh, first of all, when they hear him read the passage, they're like, wow, this is pretty amazing. But then Jesus kind of uh, uh, chastises them for their lack of faith, and they get enraged. And they take hold of him to kill him. This is in church they do this. They grab him, these church people, they grab him, and they drag him out there to the cliff in order to throw him over and kill him. And uh, of course, it wasn't his time, he just kind of walked through. But the point is this the, these church people just really showed themselves not to be very good church people at all. I was talking earlier about um, in church, well, I think that would be more sensible, but um, there, there ought to be compassion or love for us as Christians. If we exhibit all of these things faith and virtue and knowledge and self control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly uh, love and agape love, if we have these things in our lives. Wow, you know, what kind of people will we be and show ourselves to be? We're, we're not going to be with the mob who grabs Jesus just because we don't like what he says or wonder about what he says and drag him out to kill him of all things. That's um, that's pretty extreme there. And yet, uh, so often people in church will will uh, bite and attack and, and uh, uh, stab in the back and talk behind the back and do wicked things and unkind things to one another. 
But these things ought not to be. We ought to have lives that are full of these qualities that are given here. And so we've gone through all of them. We've gone through all of them. Here's the list one more time. And uh, these are things that we ought to be aware of. Let us be people of faith. Let us be people of moral uh, virtue, of moral excellence, of integrity. Let us be Christians who know God, who exercise self-control, who persevere through the hard times, who are godly in their lives, and who show love, the brotherly kind of love and the agape kind of love, which is the selfless kind of giving love. That we, we should have. Let us show these eight things. And if we do that, there are some pretty incredible promises that this passage said about us. And Lord willing, we will talk about that next week. Please pray with me as we wrap up this morning's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you have given to us in your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would show ourselves to be your people and, and show these things to be more and more fruitful and abundant in our lives. Help us to be Christians of faith and of virtue and of knowledge and of self-control and of perseverance and godliness and brotherly love and agape love. Help us to be believers that show these things forth in our lives and let the world see for your glory, for your glory, as we go forth and spread your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for being at church this morning. And, uh...